Okay, first of all, welcome to our spring um, 2016 Child Welfare Dialogue. Thank you all so much for coming and finding parking and finding your way to this new building. Um, so we are very excited today to have Jill durr as our speaker. Um, she is serves right now as the Zellerbach Family Foundation Professor in the School of Social Welfare and is co-director of the Center for Child and Youth Policy at UC Berkeley. She was recently selected as a member of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare, an honorary society of distinguished scholars. Her research focuses on the relationship of the state to vulnerable families, particularly those ch touched by the child welfare system. She's written or co-written 10 books on topics related to family poverty, child maltreatment, and child welfare. Many of you in the room have read a lot of her work. Um, her interests target the intersection between poverty, early childhood development, parenting, and the service systems designed to address these issues. Her research approach typically relies on the voices of service uh, system consumers to identify the impacts of social problems and social service solutions for family life. Um, and I'd just like to give a big welcome to Dr. Barrick. Thanks, Ellen, and thanks for coming, everybody. What a terrific group we have. This is wonderful. And thanks for coming out on this chilly day. Um, I really am enjoying being in Madison. I've never been to Madison before, so this is really a nice trip for me. You all know that Madison is the Berkeley of Wisconsin, or with, uh, Berkeley of the rest of the country. So I hope that you prove that true to me, which means that you are innovative and creative and somewhat disruptive, <laughs> and all those great things that we love in our Berkeley students, um, in, in addition to your great intelligence. So really glad to be here and to share some time with you. Glad there's still snow on the ground. I know the rest of you are like, what is she talking about? Glad that there's snow on the ground. We don't get snow. So we don't ever get snow. So this is really fun for me. It's just like <laughs> being in a park or something. It's just so playful. Anyway, I'm loving it. So, so, so live it up. Enjoy, enjoy all that, all the, that great tur snow turns into water. Love that water. They serve you water at like breakfast this morning. We had breakfast, we had water. That's really special. <laughs> we don't have any in California. All right. So I am thrilled to be talking with you today. Um, uh, Ellen and I talked about a couple of different things that we could have a conversation about, um, but we thought we would land on this topic of international comparisons, okay? So we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about some work that I've been doing lately with some colleagues, um, uh, comparing the United States system to other countries. And so I'm hoping that we can engage in a dialogue about that. Um, I want to first acknowledge my collaborators on this project. I'm working with Marit Skivenis at the University of Bergen in Norway. Um, I'm working with Taja Pozo at the University of Tampara, Finland. Jonathan Dickens at University of East Anglia, England. And I mentioned Neil Gilbert who is at University of California, Berkeley because Neil put together a gathering about five years ago of 11 professors from 11 different Western industrialized countries to come together and talk about what our child welfare systems were like so that we could learn from one another. And out of that 11 country analysis, we birthed a research project that we'll be, ta I'll be talking with you today about that only focuses on four countries. So he's the sort of the father of all of this work together. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time giving you a helicopter overview of child welfare in four countries. We could actually spend hours, days, weeks talking about what's different in the United States compared to these other three countries. And of course there are many, many other countries that do things differently as well, right? Part of my learning over the last three years with my colleagues is that I continue to learn new things like you do it you do it how? You do it, what, what, how do you do it over there? You, you mean you don't really use the word child abuse in Finland, really? Well, what do you guys talk about, right? So it's been, it's an awakening for me all the time when I think I've got it and I understand how it works in another country and then we meet and I learn, oh no, I didn't have it right. So I realize that in our conversation today, we're just gonna sort of buzz over the top, 
can sort of get some glim glimpses at some similarities and differences um, because of time. And then what we'll really talk about is the point in child welfare in their system of providing support and services and prevention services to families into the system, into the place where sometimes all of us in all of our countries do have to separate children from their parents. And we do it under involuntary circumstances, okay? So that's the point at which we're really gonna spend a little bit of time talking today. And then we're gonna talk in that framework of when we have to make a separation, how do kids come into play? Like what is the focus of our efforts when it comes to kids? And do kids have any say in this experience of being separated from their parents, okay? Because that's quite different in the different countries. Talk about how that influences our practice. And then the main goal today is, as we talk about this, is to think about what do we do in the United States and could it be different? Right? As we think about the way they do things differently in other countries, we don't have to stick with what we have, folks. Just because we've been doing it this way for a long time and our roots are deep, it doesn't have to be this way. And I have to say that in the uh, long time that I've been in this field, child welfare has changed a lot and it is a lot better than it used to be which is really inspiring because it means that we are on the right trajectory and it can get better and better. So maybe there's some things we talk about today that will inspire you to say, oh, maybe we could be a little bit more like them in some particular ways. And then we just have to think creatively together about, well, how do we get there, right? Because all of you are going out in the field to help work with families, to help change families, to help families themselves be inspired to change. So you're change agents. That's what you do for a living, you change. So change systems, why not? Why not be engaged in changing the whole ball game, not just individual families one at a time, right? Okay, so. Oh, it's my helicopter, okay. So here we go. Let's look at a couple of different countries. All right. Um, I began my talk by saying the grass is always greener, right? The reason I say that is because I don't know how familiar you are with the Nordic welfare systems, but they're kind of different. And usually my Berkeley students say to me, wow, that looks like a great place to live. So before I tell you anything about the Nordic systems, and again, I'm focused mostly on Norway and Finland, but Sweden and Denmark are a lot alike. Can you tell me what do you know about these places in terms of just their whole welfare state? Do you know anything about them? Well, I'm going to have to ask you to be involved today. Some of you know something about these places. I know it's true. Universal healthcare. Universal healthcare, absolutely true. They got universal healthcare. Anything else? Paid childcare. They have paid universal childcare for children under the age of six. All families, every single one of them, every single one of them, free every single day. Mm-hmm. Paid. Yep. Uh, paid parental leave. Paid parental leave. So you do have a child, you can exit the labor market, you can continue to get your pay, and then you can re-enter the labor market in that same job that was held for you. And not only the, 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 the mother can do this, but the father can do it too. And there are incentives to encourage fathers to take parental leave outside of the labor market, right? Anything else? Okay, so that's great. You can already see they have a lot of things that are different there. They have um, what's called a tight safety net, okay? So in other words, their welfare system as a social democratic state is very tight. They provide a lot of services to help support families who are being sort of shuttled about by the market, right? So a lot of unemployment insurance, a lot of assistance for families, for adults when they have to move out of the labor market, right? Because they lost their job. So a lot of financial supports, child allowances. Everybody gets a child allowance, whether you're poor or rich. If you have a baby, we give you money because we know that it costs money to raise kids. So all of these countries have a rich child allowance system, okay? Um, parental leave, health care, uh, universal child care, and a whole range of services. When a baby is born, everybody gets something. I love Finland's baby boxes, okay? In Finland, everybody gets a baby box. This is the cutest thing in the whole wide world, all right? 
you have a baby in Finland and on your doorstep arrives this cardboard box. Everybody gets one and it doesn't matter if you're the richest per person in Finland or you're the poorest person in Finland. You get the box and you open up the box and the box turns into a crib and all babies in Finland sleep in their cardboard baby box that the government sent them because that's what you do in Finland. You don't go out and you buy a fancy mahogany crib. You put your baby in the baby box. And you look inside the baby box and what do you have in there? Oh, let's see. You have clothes, you have bibs, you have bottles, you have books, you have videos, you have pacifiers, you have an array, an assortment of things that every new parent needs the day they bring their baby home. <coughs> rich or poor, everybody gets it. And it's a cultural phenomenon that everybody uses it. The purpose of the baby box is in part to create an even start for everybody and to say to everybody in Finland, everybody starts at the same place. We may end up in different places, but we all start in the same place. We all start in a cardboard box, okay? So it sort of speaks to you something about the role of the government in providing a service to every single person in the whole country that's exactly the same, that says to everybody in that, in that country, we all start in the same place. And then let's see where we go from there, right? So Finland has very sort of, uh, an, the, in addition to that, they have home health nurses, they have visiting nurses, they have a, an array of services to families when babies are born, okay? Look at those beautiful children. Aren't they so cute? So if they have a pretty tight safety net for everybody in the country in general, then what does it look like in terms of their child, child welfare system? Okay. So first of all, they call their child welfare system a family support system. It's not a child welfare system. It's a family support service, a uh, family support system. And they provide families services based upon family need, okay? So the triggering event, how do you become eligible to get a service in Finland or in Norway? It's based upon whether or not you and, your chi and or your child have a need, not child abuse, a need. Okay, so that could be a developmental need, that could be a mental health need, that could be an educational need, it could be a social need, it could be a physical need, it could be a well-being need. So when kids' well-being is compromised in some way, that's the triggering event that child welfare gets involved. Okay. Now, to give you a sense of what their service system might look like for a family who presents as sort of similar to a family that we might be working with. Take um, a single mother and her child. Uh, let's say the mother is drug involved in such a way that it is um, interrupting her capacity to parent her children, her child safely. And let's say that um, that family is now in the service system of the, fam of the family support system in Finland or Norway, right? What would happen? Well, typically, um, in the morning, somebody's going to come knocking on the door early, 6.30 or 7 in the morning, early. A social worker is going to come in, and that social worker is going to help the mom do that morning thing. Feeding, clothing, diapering, maybe changing, washing, wa da 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 getting that baby ready for the day or that child. And then that social worker is modeling for the mom, this is what it looks like to be attentive, to be caring, to be responsive to the interactions of you and your child. That social worker is then going to say goodbye to mom, take baby, and drive baby or child to the local daycare, deposit child, where child will be taken care of for the next 10 hours by some alternative caregiver in a child care center, center along with a bunch of other kids. Social worker is going to return to the home and pick up mom and say, okay, we're going to treatment now, let's go. I've arranged it, we're gonna go together and I'm gonna get you there and you're gonna now go to drug treatment for the rest of the day where you're gonna engage in what you need to engage in so that you can be a full-time mom. And at the end of the day, that social worker is gonna bring her back home, bring baby back home and spend the evening with them at home 
doing the evening activities, cooking, cleaning, getting the child ready for bed, modeling, 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 what it is we're looking for in healthy parenting for that, for that child. That child's probably going to get a therapist. There will be a therapist involved. There's probably going to be sort of a developmental therapist involved. There will be a lot of social workers, educational specialists involved. They're going to have weekly team meetings with all the professionals to figure out what else can we do for this family. What other services can we give to this family? I can't convey to you enough how different, the, especially Finland is from us, when they talk about these weekly meetings where they try to figure out, is there another service that this family could benefit from? Is there another thing we can give them that they could benefit from? And they just keep layering the services with the family. Unlike us, they're going to be very unlikely to remove that child to foster care. They are going to keep providing services for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years. And the typical age of entry into foster care in Finland, Norway, and Sweden, and Denmark, is between seven and nine. That's the typical age of entry. Remember, our typical age of entry is our babies. Our babies are who come into foster care in the United States in very large numbers, OK, and young children. No, not so in the Nordic countries, because they wait, because they're layering services on and trying to figure out, is this enough, is this enough, is this enough? So the age of entry is very, very old compared to ours, because finally, at some point, somebody says, it's just not working, and it's not getting better, and we can't serve this family anymore. And so we're going to recommend a separation. And so a very, very, very different service context than what we have. Um, Questions? Okay, interrupt me if you have questions. All right, so now we turn to the United States, and let me just go back to Finland and Norway. Finland and Norway are really, really similar in many, many ways. There are some distinctions, but for today's talk, think of them as the same place. Now, the United States, um, I don't have to tell you, has a rather thinner safety net than what you might find in the Nordic countries, right? We don't give child allowances to people. We give them a little tiny um, taste of t our TANF benefits for a minute before we take it away from them. Our aid is conditional. We'll give you aid as long as you behave in ways that we want you to. Um, you know that it's not really one system, it's really 50 systems because it's very much state-oriented and so states have a lot of control, a lot of power in the United States to design their uh, welfare system. Our unemployment insurance is, is um, much thinner than you might see in a Nordic country. We don't have universal childcare, we don't have paid parental leave, we kind of have health insurance now for everybody, it's a little bit of a different model, it's much better than it used to be, thank goodness. Um, we have some uh, services for families when babies are first born, but it really depends on geography. It just depends on where you live, right? Everything in the United States is location, location, location. So it's highly decentralized in the United States. Our system is highly decentralized. When you think about our U.S. child welfare system, then aren't they the cutest things in the whole wide world? Oh my God, that's who we serve, right? They're just the most adorable people ever. Um, we don't refer to our system as a family support system. As you know, we call it a child welfare system. And in many states, we call it a child protection system. And I think that language is really important to think about. How we name what we do drives what we do, right? So we are, in many cases, a child protection system. We have a very high threshold of need compared to the Nordic countries that have a very low threshold of need. Families and children can present with any variety of sort of small needs and get a service. Here it takes a lot to get inside our door, right? And unlike the Nordic systems that focus on well-being, compromised well-being and um, family need, our orientation is all around child maltreatment, child abuse, child neglect. Maltreatment is our entry point for eligibility, right? So a very, very different system. And then you're living and working in the system yourselves, all of you, so you know what services families get when we activate the system with that hotline maltreatment report. You know what that variety of services are. Again, it depends on geography. Some of our cities, some of our counties, some of our states offer more to families. Some offer less. One of our tools in our tool book, toolbox is removal to out-of-home care. Some have differential response. We have some in-home services, but we don't have the same service array that you heard in the Nordic countries. It's sort of different, right? 
Okay. So another way to think about the differences between the Nordic countries and the U.S. child welfare systems is to use this metaphor of a house, right? So a house, let's think of the house as the service system, child welfare service system. In the Nordic countries, the house has a really big door, meaning there's room for a lot of people to come into the house to get services, right? And they can just open the door any way they want. They can come and knock on the door and say, pick me, I need a service, help me, please. They can have you, a professional, say, please come help this person get services. There are lots of ways to get in the door, and lots and lots of people have access to get into the door, to get into the house. And once you're inside the house, you get a lot of different services. You can sit down, and hang out on the couch, and spend a lot of time in the service house. You can be there for years. You can get services from the kitchen. You can get services from the living room. You can get services from the, from the dining room. Lots of services. Time limits, not really. Everything's free, and you can stay there for um, a very long time. So if you think about that same metaphor, oh, I didn't know it had that little sound. <laughs> That's sweet. Oh, I remember, okay, that was from, okay, sorry. I took this slide from a different presentation where the sound had a meaning. Anyway, sorry. It was supposed to be like, the doorbell was ringing. It doesn't matter. Um, in the child protection house of the United States, you see our door is really narrow, right? And to get in, you have to ring the doorbell, meaning somebody has to make a hotline call of suspected maltreatment, right? And then we assess to determine whether there's a safety need or there's a risk of harm. And if there's a risk of harm, we open the door and we let people in, okay? So very narrow, very narrowly defined about who gets into our house. Once they're in, we have, a, we have services. Our services are very time limited, <coughs> right? How long, does, how long are reunification services? How long do we give families to reunify? 15 months. 15 months. Do you have time limits on your in-home services in Wisconsin? Ours are six months in California, six months. So maybe yours are better than that. Maybe yours are a year. They're not seven. <laughs> They're time limited. They're always time limited in everybody's state, okay? So we have in-home services that are limited to six months. We have out-of-home services that are limited to 15 months, perhaps, in Wisconsin. If you have, in California, if you have a child age three or younger and your child is um, brought into the foster care system, you have six months six-month limit, and then we move towards termination of parental rights. So we have a very tight time frame for families to um, completely change everything in their life, right? Okay. So one last comparison. If you think about the Nordic countries compared to the U.S., um, the Nordic countries with regard to child welfare would be considered proactive, whereas we are reactive. We respond after something has happened, right? They provide universal services. We provide selective services to some. They provide, their, their whole system is institutional, meaning it's part, of, it's part of their whole institution. The baby box is a good example. Everybody gets it. It's part of what they think of as something that everyone has a guaranteed right towards. Ours are residual, meaning they're just on the margins. Theirs is a very therapeutic response, and ours is a legalistic and investigative response, okay? So those are some just some stark contrasts. So before we go on, any questions about the Nordic countries, or what we do here, or comments about it? Yeah. So I'm assuming they have to have some way to pay for all of these things, so what do like their taxes look like? Their tax system is extreme. Their tax base is very, very high, very high compared to ours. Pardon? What's their minimum wage? I don't know what their minimum wage is. I don't know what their minimum wage is, but they have. Um, it's sort of a different. I've I've sort of really learned over t the last few years that there's a very different cultural philosophy of the role of the state to the citizen in the Nordic countries compared to here. 
here, you know, we have um, a lot of ambivalence. I'm, I'm going to make some generalizations, of course. There's differences across the country. But as a country, we are more ambivalent about the role of the government in being helpful to us. We are somewhat distrustful of the government in being helpful to us. And in the Nordic countries, there's a notion that the government helps, right? They help us get my daycare, and they help my kids go to college, and they help my kids, and they helped me, you know, get my paternity leave, and they helped me during those hard times when I lost my job. And so it's a very reciprocal relationship. And so because the state touches everybody's life in a Nordic country, there's also a sense that, well, but they're helping everybody, so I'm happy to give them some of my money because they give me goods in return. So it's a very reciprocal relationship. Whereas here, we kind of begrudgingly pay those taxes because we don't always know what we're getting, and we know that somebody else is getting something, and not everybody gets anything. And so it's a very different relationship we have in the United States. So yes, their tax base is very high. Yeah, and, that, that, and there we have a starting point for why it's kind of hard to import some of what they do here. Because what they do costs a lot. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Are there roots in this sort of framework of doing things? Did they always do it this way, or did they find this the best? Oh, that's a great question. The roots, this all came after World War II, OK? Um, their social, dem what they call a social democratic welfare state, was really established after wor World War II, when many of these countries were decimated by the war, or severely injured economically by the war. And um, the, the difference in um, the, the, the discrepancy between the wealthy and the poor in these countries after the war was pretty flat, actually, because of, it, uh, because of its economic disruption to the whole system. Um, in fact, the baby box, what it, I keep going back to it because I love it so much, the baby box was um, created right after the war as, a, as an intentional strategy to create this sense of universalism, to create, uh, to, to, to be responsive to maternal and child health issues, high infant mortality rates at the end of the war, because again, they were, so they were such a poor country. Um, and so all of the roots of these systems took place after the war. The roots of our system, of course, are largely in the Roosevelt administration prior to the war, during the Depression. So the time frame is similar. Many, it's an interesting sort of phenomenon to think so many countries that have a lot in common all were moving in kind of a similar direction at around the same historical period, the 1930s and 40s. They went a little bit further than we did, but we certainly went down a path that was quite a, a diversion from where we had been previously. Yeah. You had a question? So once they're at the point where the child needs to be separated, yep. um, what kind of happens after that in terms of their take on permanency and where the child would go? Love it, OK. Um, they uh, use foster care just as we do. They use kinship care, but not as much as we do. Um, I understand that Wisconsin, about 30% of your kids are in kinship care. California, it's closer to 50%. Um, and in the Nordic countries, it's significantly lower. But it's, an, it's, it's something they're importing from us, actually. So they use some kinship care. They use a lot of foster care. And then they don't really think about permanency. So permanency is not a frame that they're familiar with. And they are beginning to import that concept from us. Okay? The reason that they're not in, um, why they haven't typically pursued re, uh, reunifi uh, reunification and permanency plans is mo mostly because if you've worked with a family for seven years and then you finally decided that this really isn't going to work, then their optimism for the likelihood that that family is going to change is now pretty low, right? We have high optimism that families can change because we just met them, right? I mean, in a relative sense, right? They have been working with them for so long that finally at the point that they have to make a separation, they've lost their confidence in the capacity of, for change. So they don't pursue reunification. They don't pursue adoption. Uh, adoption was illegal in just until a few years ago. And so even today, adoption is a highly unusual phenomenon. And so the kids just age, age in the foster home. And they don't have the same issues with instability that we do either. Um, a different study that I did with Mara it's given us on um, uh, it was an a international a comparison of our foster parents and our foster caregivers and our foster caregiving system really revealed to me some of those stark differences in the way they treat their foster parents. 
um, which probably contributes to their stability. They have a very richly supported foster care approach, right? Yes. So then do the foster parents make like parental decisions for them as they age? Um, or do they, they then take on the rights even though they're maybe legal rights even though they're not adopted? Well, again, it's sort of like what we do here. So the foster, it's a mediated relationship, okay. right? So they make the basic decisions about where the child's going to go to school and all the rest of it. If a, if a appendectomy is required or a medical, emer medical procedure is required, then they involve the courts for that, just like we involve the courts for that. So the, their foster parents have limited rights. They don't have as many rights as a guardian would in the United States, but they still have limited rights and they just raise the child. Um, you were talking about how families um, will have like one social worker that's working with them. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking about how this profession, like specifically like child protective services, um, like as a position that is like high stigma in society yeah. and um, there's always a shortage of people will, that want to do that job. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk at all about like what this, what those numbers look like mm -hmm. or what, mm -hmm. how those positions are valued or even mm -hmm. like social workers thought of as a, as a female uh, uh, mm -hmm. field? Mm -hmm. What does that look like mm -hmm. in Nordic countries? Mm -hmm. Social workers are civil, ser civil servants, and there are a lot of civil servants in the Nordic countries, right? When you have such a high tax base and you have so many services being offered to the citizenry, that means you have a lot of your, your population is engaged as government workers all over the place, right? So they have many, many more government workers across the whole country than we do, which means, and again, because of this sort of reciprocal relationship of I give you my taxes and you give me goodies in return, most civil servants are middle class professionals who are treated with respect because you do good things for the citizenry. They also, of course, have this strong emphasis on these preventive services. So unlike the United States, you know, because they have more, they have more tools in their toolbox to use with families, they can be seen as uh, helpful, care, helpful professionals in people's lives. So the same stigma that we might attach in some jurisdictions in the United States to child protection work, you just don't see it there. And so it's generally considered just you're just another government worker providing another government service that's really helpful to families, to a lot more families than, than we serve. And so this, it's, a, it's a different issue. And the retention is not an issue like it is here. Oh, so this is the part that like kills me, okay? Because it's just really, it's a really good life over there. Um, so, in I'll only speak to Norway. In Norway, if you're a child welfare agency and you need foster parents, you're doing recruitment. They recruit, they target teachers, nurses, social workers. They target people who have already decided to dedicate their life to helping and mostly dedicated their life to helping kids, right? It's too hot, I'm sorry, it's distracting me. So they target them because they think they're gonna probably be people who have already kind of figured out the landscape of helping. They then, let's say you're my nurse and you have decided to become a foster parent. You go through licensing and the training and all the rest of it, right? And now you're waiting to have Johnny come be placed in your home. And now Johnny is placed in your home. So I, the social worker, go to your employer, the hospital, and I say to the employer, what's your name? Leah. Leah needs to take a break from her job for the next six months because we're about to place a foster child in her home, which is a service that we all as a society benefit from. And so here, here's some money to hold Leah's position so that you can go and buy a different Leah to go do Leah's job for the next six months. And then I give to Leah your salary from there. And you get to take your same salary home for the next six months, right? Then I meet you at the local Target, whatever it is, right? Walgreens, whatever it's called there, Ikea. And I say, well, so what do you need now? You got a baby coming to your house. So do you need a crib? Do you need a changing table? Do you need a diaper genie? Do you need a, 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 let's go buy it. And so we go and we buy it. And we bring it home and we set up your little nursery and we get you set up. And then you care for Johnny for six months. And we do our monthly check-ins and all the rest of it. At the end of six months, we assess together whether or not you still need to be on break from your job full-time 
or whether it's maybe part-time. And if we decide that Johnny's needs are pretty intense and you need to be there 24 hours a day, then we go back to the hospital and we say, can we give her another six months? And they say, sure, and you keep doing it for six months. Or you might say, more likely, I can actually move into part-time work now because Johnny's now going to go to daycare half of the time and I'm going to care for him half of the time. So you take a half-time break. You do this in six-month increments until you're ready to return to your place of employment. Because remember, all kids go to daycare. So sooner or later, Johnny's going to come back to daycare right during the days. And you're going to go back to your place of employment where they held your job for you. And you'll go ahead and get your job. And then you're going to get a nice, significant, comfortable supplement to your salary to be that caregiver you know, from the evening till the morning until he goes to daycare. It's a little different than how we do it. <laughs> it. That's the part that's sort of breathtaking to me. Because there's so much that's right about that. There's so much that's right about that, right? And there's so much that we could import about that, right? I know we don't have the same money to do it the same way. But we, as social workers, can push our agencies to think critically about, well, who are we recruiting? Who are we targeting? Who are we trying to bring into this cadre of our foster parents? And how can we be of assistance during that transition, during those first weeks when Johnny comes to live with any foster parent? What can we do to make sure those resources are there, to make sure they feel supported, right? We can't go all the way, but there are some things we could do. Yeah. Um, so you kind of two parts. Um, one is how many foster or placements does a child typically experience? And then once they do age out of the system, what are their outcomes and maybe relationships with uh, foster parents? So it's a good news and a bad news story. The good news story is their placement stability is better than ours. We don't do a very good job around placement stability. And we could have a wonderful long conversation about placement stability here because I feel strongly about it. Um, they do a pretty good job of that, about that. But we don't have a lot of studies. We don't have as many studies as we do in the United States. But Denmark, oops, my, my Nordic map. Remember Denmark? Denmark mm -hmm. has done, and Sweden, have both done studies looking at outcomes after foster care. And this is the bad news story. Their kids don't do better than ours. Why do you think that's the case? They're aging out. There's lack of permanency. When they get out, what does that mean for them that they go into adults? adults? So you mean sort of like the, the confusion of young adulthood? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Okay, so it might be that they just sort of fall, they fall, like ours fall, often without a safety net of any kind, the structured safety net. Yeah? So what along that line, some may say that in the U.S. there's a little bit of jumping too quickly to place in the foster care, mm -hmm. that's been one argument, mm -hmm. and when we talk about there being layering for seven years, there may yeah. be argument that that's too long to wait, and that some of the effects Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Helpful. Yeah. I think because either way, foster care is always going to be um, separation, loss, mm -hmm. trauma, mm -hmm. no matter how good it is for the kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We don't know the answer, right? I mean, who, how do we know the answer? But the theory suggests exactly these three component parts, right? Most importantly, theories are there is early trauma, and when children experience trauma early in life, especially sustained trauma, because even if those kids were serving them for seven years, things are not going well in those families often. So those early experiences of trauma have lasting effects. That's one theory. The second theory is, of course, that they don't have a full safety net. They have a better safety net than we do, but they don't have a fully de defined uh, programmatic safety net for their kids. And the third, that there must be something about that early separation, any separation, that is just really, really, really tough on kids. So nobody's figured it out. No matter how attractive what they're doing might be, they haven't figured it out in a way that means that they got to the green grass, right? 
their kids struggle just like our kids struggle. And we still have to figure out a way so that all of us, regardless of the design of our system, can make sure that our kids do well when they become young adults, right? Let me have one more. I skipped over you. Did you have a comment and, or question and then question. we'll go back? Yeah. Um, you had mentioned adoption was illegal until yeah. recently. Does that include infant adoption? Yeah, they didn't do adoption. So if, a, so I'm, that just amazes me. So like if a mom here decides they don't want the child yeah. or for whatever reason, so what would a mom do in the Nordic? Foster care. Okay, so mm -hmm. they would put the child in mm -hmm. foster care. Yep, it's just a really different sort of cultural frame, right? That's again something that they've imported from us. Is they see we are the we are big time adopters. United States, we are the big winners on the adoption, you know, like competition. We do it a lot, and we have Im exported those ideas, and they have now attached themselves to those ideas, and they've made it legal. I think there were 14 adoptions in Norway last year, so it's. It's happening. So we did 50,000. <laughs> so then how long would a child be in foster care? You mean if they were placed as an in infant? Right. Their life. Their childhood. Their childhood. Wow. And they would be in a, an adoptive-like relationship. Again, they have very good placement stability. So they'd be in a, a strong rela a family that took care of them. But they just wouldn't have legal permanence the way think so we think of it. So then would the bio mom have visitation? Uh, they, from what I understand, they don't do visitation like we do visitation. It's just, it's again, the frame is once we've made that decision, then that's where they're very different from us. We are trying to keep that family together. We are trying to pull that family back together. We're trying to repair and, and, and uh, uh, support that family. And again, they're, they're, they have these brighter lines than we do. So you're in care. We move on. Very different. Can I hold those questions for just a minute? Do you mind? Because I'm, 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 I'm behind. Is that OK? I'll come back to you, I promise. OK. So I haven't even talked about England yet. Oh my gosh, we have so much to do. I haven't talked about England. Why did I not talk about England? Well, when we started this study, we intentionally chose England and the United States Finland and Norway because these two are the same and these two are the same. And so we'd have more of the sameness and then we could compare across. And then we're like, England is not the same as us. Oh my gosh, they're so not the same. They're kind of in the middle. But my arrows are sort of pointing to the ocean, so sorry about that. <laughs> I hope you know where England is, okay? I hope because it's over, it's down. Anyway, they're in the middle and they truly are in the middle. Their philosophy, their laws, push them to Europe. They are so aspirational. They so much want to be a family support system. Everything in their writing and their documents suggests they're a family support system, right? However, they have a crazy, crazy media in England. And the media grab these horror stories that we all hope never happen in our careers, right, of tragedies and then crucify social workers in England, making them immediately a reactive system, and they pull back to be a child protection system like the United States. So their policy and their philosophy is aspirational to Europe, but their practice is reactive just like the United States. So they're kind of in the middle, and that makes this data collection kind of really messy, but let's not worry about that right now. Okay. I would be the first one to say that our House of Child Protection in the United States could use a little bit of a rehab, right? <laughs> in my view, it could, it could be a little bit different. I would say that it's not particularly responsive to families with basic needs. Um, I would say the fact that we only make our services available to families where there's harm or substantial risk of harm is, a, is too narrow. Um, I would say that our state interventions are awfully intrusive and time limited. Um, the risk and safety paradigm that we live in makes services sub quite stigmatized instead of universal. Um, and we really focus on these acutely needy families and we don't deal with family or child well-being very much. That's what I would say. That's like my little laundry list of things I'd like to fix. So let me just take two minutes and see if there's anything else you want to fix. How do you criticize the system? 
How would you like it to be different? Um, I feel at times that um, we're just kind of a, another branch of law enforcement uh -huh. in our really tight um, like, like cohesion to the court system and law enforcement right. is something that is very stigmatizing and um, detrimental to families. Okay, so you came in to help, and to the field to help, and yet you're really closely aligned with law enforcement, which has this punitive aspect to it. Okay, that's a, that's a really important critique. Good. Yeah. every jurisdiction in the country, right? And so you're very concerned that it is not an equal opportunity experience for families. Really, really glad you mentioned that. Absolutely. Yeah. There's just not a notion of other social responsibility. It's kind of like something's wrong, the social workers will fix it. Or, you know, there's something wrong with the kids, the school will fix it. We do service provision in silos. In silos. We are very siloed, OK? So we'd like to see more cooperation among service providers. OK, good. Anything else? Okay, the point of this is to say we should be critical. Not critical as in I tear it down and I run away from it, but we should be critical analysts of these systems that we are walking in to be parts of because if we're not, then we forget that opportunity to be the change agents to make them better, right? To, to really respond to and to make sure that our coworkers are aware of these racial disproportionalities and figure out what are they doing? What am I doing that might be contributing to it? To figure out what our relationship is with law enforcement and to say, is there a way that we can distance ourselves so that we can be seen as helpers rather than enforcers? We can be the people who go into these agencies and help everyone think differently about what we do to make them better. And so that's part of what I want you to keep doing is thinking, what is it I might want to import? And how would I do that, OK? So um, here's a really simple version. And we sort of talked about this already. Uh, families become eligible for services somehow. We try to provide some in-home services to them. If that doesn't work, sometimes we use voluntary out-of-home care. If that doesn't work, we use involuntary out-of-home care. Then we move kids to a permanency or an exit. And then kids become young adults. That's like a simple version of child welfare, right? We've already talked about eligibility. We've already said that we base it upon risk and safety. And they base it upon compromised child well-being or family need, right? We have not talked much about in-home services. So for just a minute, I'll just mention this. 7% of all the kids in Finland are receiving an in-home service at any given time. 7% of all children. Let's come over to this side, the United States. About 1% of children are reported for maltreatment every year. And two-thirds of them get an in-home service. So that means that less than 1% of our US kids get in-home services from our child welfare system. And fully 7% in Finland get in-home services. So that just gives you some sense of the scope of who's involved, right? And again, these are seven years long. Our in-home services in the United States, what we're capturing there is our ER service, or ER, sorry, in California we call them ER, our early intervention services, which typically last 30 days. And we refer families to services. We say, go, here's a parent ed class. There's my service. Here's a drug treatment program. Here's my service. Here's an anger management class. There's my service. And we call that an in-home service. That's a referral. So, so you can see how we're kind of different from Finland, right, in terms of just the proportion. And then of all the kids served in Norway, and they can't give me an estimate of what the number is, 70% of them are served with in-home services. So that's sort of similar to us. When you look at voluntary out-of-home care, there's really a big difference here, right? In Finland, most of their out-of-home care is voluntary. And I look at them, I'm like, oh, yeah, right. We call it voluntary here, too, but it's really coerced. How many of you have ever done a voluntary service with a family, but you felt like it was actually sort of had a layer of coercion? Yeah. If you don't do this really nice thing that I'm giving you an op opportunity to do, I'm going to have to remove your child, right? Why do we call them voluntary? They're 
actually voluntary. They're actually voluntary there in Finland. Okay? Um, England and Norway are more similar. Between 25 and 30 percent of all their care cases are um, voluntary. And then we don't have any data for the United States of America, so I just took data from California where we do have data. And it's about 10 percent of all of our out-of-home care cases are what we call voluntary. And these are almost all kinship care cases where we do a six-month voluntary placement agreement as a strategy to move them into guardianship. So in essence, we don't really do voluntary out-of-home care much in, in uh, our state. Um, and so instead, we're going to talk about, we're going to focus on involuntary care. OK. Um, do you think, given now what you know about the Nordic systems, that the prevalence of kids being in out-of-home care in the Nordic countries is probably about the same as the prevalence of our out-of-home care rate in the United States? Or is it lower? Or is it higher? What's your best guess? Like, how many kids do they actually separate? The government separates. Higher, lower, about the same. Any guesses? Given what you know now. Lower? How many say lower? Most of you. It's higher. Okay? Our rate of out-of-home placement, our prevalence rate, is somewhere between five and six kids per thousand in the United States. And it's over eight per thousand in Norway and almost nine per thousand in Finland. Okay? So again, back to that reciprocal relationship between the citizen and the state, the state is quite comfortable keeping kids separated from their parents to a much larger degree than we are in the United States. So when we are concerned about oh, how many kids we're taking into out-of-home care, and I get concerned about that, in an international perspective, we're lower than other states that have a much richer prevention enterprise than we do, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about involuntary care. Okay. And I'm going to talk for a minute about kids. So you know that when we have to make a decision about the possibility of removing a child from their parents' home, that we do that based upon a risk and safety framework, correct? Okay. Is there harm? Is there imminent risk of harm? That's your framework, right? Same, same with us in California. So child safety and risk of harm is the criteria we use, okay? In Finland and Norway, the criteria is it would be in the child's best interest to make a separation. In England, the wording is the child's welfare is paramount. And that would be the reason we would suggest to a judge, recommend to a judge, that a, um, that a decision needs to be made to remove a child. So can you think for a minute? I don't know how many of you are working sort of in the front end of the system where sometimes you're, you, you have to make these decisions with your colleagues and supervisors to separate kids. Have any of you been in, involved in those decisions? OK. So think for a minute about one or two of those cases that you've been involved in where you had to recommend a separation. And you were using a risk and safety framework when you made those decisions. If you had been using a child's best interest framework or a child's welfare is paramount, what things would you have considered differently? And would you have made a decision earlier or later? So think for a minute about that. And then would somebody volunteer to just like walk us through very, very, very briefly the circumstances of the case and what you might have done differently? Okay, tell me more. I, I just feel like when I think about the best interest, yeah. I think about safety. 
safety and risk of harm. Oh, okay. And about them being taken care of, neglected, abused, whatever. And so I just, I, I guess I understand that in these other countries, they don't like to use the term child protection or, yeah. and everything, but yeah. I, I just feel like it's semantics and oh, okay. it's all about child's best interest because their safety and uh -huh. risk of something being uh -huh. done to them is their best interest. Oh, what a fabulous comment. Um, okay, and it might also be because remember our clientele are already only narrowly defined as families who have a child abuse or neglect phenomenon going on, right? And so to think about child's best interests, if you have a completely different population over here, that I can see why you would say, well, but there was child abuse or neglect going on and so it was in their best interest. So I can see why that would you would think of it as semantic. That's really, really helpful to me. Thank you. I don't have any specific case examples right now, but I just think if I'm thinking in terms of child's best interest, I think one thing that would factor in that we don't factor in now is kind of like this idea of are we doing more harm than mm -hmm. is good if we remove a child? Because mm -hmm. sometimes, like Casey was saying earlier, like that grief and loss is so much more traumatic than what they're already experiencing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it would not be in the child's best interest mm -hmm. to remove them if there's um, maltreatment. Um, but I mean, it depends on the circumstances, but I just feel like that's another factor that you would take into consideration that we don't currently because of the safety and risk of harm framework mm -hmm. that we have. What an excellent point. That's an excellent point. Absolutely. Really good point. Based on the training of the workers, I almost feel like child's best interest could be interpreted very broadly. Mm -hmm. So that could a lot of kids being taken into custody versus our safety model that we have. Ah, ah, really important, right? Safety and risk is hard to measure anyway, but at least we can kind of get on the same page or hope we're on the same page to and have some more uh, uh, certainty that what you called risk and safety was the same as what you called risk and safety, which is what you called risk and safety. And when you move into child well-being, we might not agree, right? Okay, so which creates the opportunities for greater inequities. Really interesting. Okay, so they are different. So the benefit. Tell me what you just told me. What there was a there was a hazard, right? You said there was a hazard because there might be inequities. Are there benefits though to this framework? Are there advantages? Yeah. Well, I can see it being obviously less punitive, so that's definitely an advantage. Okay, so it's not necessarily about blame and assigning blame. Okay, good, yeah? I think it also might make more sense to bio parents um, when, you know, they have, they're in the mindset of this is in the best interest of my child, not I did something wrong oh. to put them in risk of, in, in, in risk of harm. Oh, interesting. So it does shift the focus to the child, doesn't it? And away from the parent. So our current paradigm focuses on the parent and what you did. And let me look at that allegation of what you did. And this shifts on the child, and it's all in their well-being well interests. Very interesting. Yeah. I know that within our framework, it's very difficult to prove emotional neglect or abuse yeah. or maltreatment. Yeah. Whereas if you're looking more at the child's best interest, I guess there's more of a possibility. Uh huh. Good. Okay. Gives you bigger, bigger platform. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. So I see you're seeing the advantages and the disadvantages besides inequities potentially. Any other disadvantages? Yeah. How do you have a baseline for knowing what that is? And is it culturally bound, right? We are a diverse country. So what, what might another cultural frame look like about a best interest standard that might be different than my cultural frame? So coming up with culturally normative values, a lot easier in Norway where they're all blonde. <laughs> really. I mean, really, okay? So 
there are some disadvantages. Okay. So there are some implications to having a big door, okay? So that's, again, when I suggested that the grass is always greener. I love the Nordic countries. I love everything they do. It's so wonderful and, and nice and, 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 and supportive over there. But there are hazards. So every time we think about importing something to our country, we have to think about the hazards. And the hazard in this case is they have a very big door, and they have these well-being standards which are not measurable or hard to measure, which might be normative, which might create inequities, which might create dis, uh, uh, disadvantages for certain groups. And so we have to be really cautious. And remember, they separate kids from parents at a much higher rate than we do. So it, does, it has the potential, not necessarily inevitability, but the potential for that door to be so big that a lot of kids get taken away from their parents in comparison to the way we do business, okay? So I want to just very, very briefly talk with you about a study that my colleagues and I did and walk you through a little bit of this um, where we were looking at the front end child welfare decision making. It's an online study we did with uh, child welfare workers like yourselves where we looked at the, those decision makers who are in the early stages, the front end who make the decision about whether or not a removal is going to be warranted, okay? And we've got these four countries. We had funding from the Norwegian Research Council. And so some of this survey involved a vignette. So John, age 11, Mira, age 9, live with their parents. Both mother and father have developmental delays and mental health problems. The school is concerned about the situation, and a psychologist has assessed the children. She has concluded that John and Mira have serious problems with learning, and they lack social skills. They're clearly lagging behind their peers, and this is confirmed by their test scores. The psychologist has stated that this is due to lack of stimuli and help from the parents, and the children need a lot of help and support. Further, the psychologist states the children lack basic social skills, especially Mira. The parents are socially withdrawn and cannot teach or show their children how to behave towards friends and other adults. The psychologist concludes that Mira and John are at significant risk of becoming as socially withdrawn as their parents. Think about where you are placed right now in your agencies. And think about whether or not in your agency the social workers surrounding you, or you yourself, would look at this story and think that this was a case of neglect. Okay? And think about whether or not your agency would provide services for this family, and whether or not this would be cause for removal. Okay? So, do you have a sense? Would you raise your hand if you think your agency would probably consider this a case of child neglect? Raise your hand if you, and none of you did for those in the front. Uh, raise your hand if you think your agency would provide services, child welfare services to this family. A couple of sort of tentative hands, not really big hands, like maybe we would. We'd assess the situation, it's a maybe. Okay. And tell me if your agency would probably consider removal. No. Okay. So it's different. Okay. So part of part of this is sort of looking at a different way at the big door phenomenon, right? So if two thirds of Norwegian social workers read this case and say, "Wow, that's child neglect." And in California, you know, 13% is sort of a blip on the screen. It's really the same as you not raising your hand. <laughs> um, that sort of suggests that there are these different cultural frames for what we consider a well-being, what we consider well-being, and who we're concerned about, right? So in Norway, they would be very likely to be concerned about these kids. Interesting that Finland didn't really say that, right? But I thought Finland and Norway were the same, right? They kind of are. If we had asked, do these children have needs, it would have been 90%. But we didn't ask if it was children had needs. We asked if they were being neglected by their parents. And we don't ascribe <coughs> blame in Finland. We don't ever say the parents have done anything wrong in Finland. We just say, did they need something from us? 
Okay? So had we said, do these children have needs, it would have been different. So we know that the, the qualitative responses from the social workers said, well, they seriously have a need. But we wouldn't say that the parents had neglected them because we don't ascribe blame to parents. Okay? So that's sort of the difference there. And then, of course, England falls in the middle because <coughs> they're, they're our middle country. Would your agency provide services for John and Mira? Yes, absolutely. Yes, most specifically. Kind of in the middle. And then what the heck? You didn't raise your hand. You were like, mm, maybe, if we'd assessed it, kind of, right? So again, the qualitative comments here were, oh, we would refer them out. We'd refer them to the school to be the silo of services. Or we refer them to the developmental disabilities program, which is the silo of services, but we wouldn't serve them, right? So that 77 percent, first I thought, oh, I guess I don't understand child welfare in my country. What? <laughs> and then I looked at the comments, like, oh, okay, good, good. We wouldn't do it, but somebody else would. Would our agency consider removal? No, in California, just like you said, pff, no. Ouch! That's all I have to say about that, right? That explains it. So when you have these big door phenomenons, lots of families can get services from us because we're concerned about a lot of different things. They would consider a removal when it comes to John and Mira, which the rest of us are like, you don't separate kids from their parents because of that, for heaven's sake, right? So it gives you some sense of what happens when you have a framework that is so expansive in terms of considering not just child abuse, but well-being, that it means that you also have these, uh, a, a different sentiment towards the opportunity for a removal, right? So that's pretty high. Um, again, this, we were like, what the heck is that? And again, the qualitative comment said, well, certainly through, through voluntary out-of-home care, we would consider it, but not involuntary care. Okay? Finland just doesn't like involuntary care, but voluntary care would be a possibility. Um, would, without help now, John and Mira are unlikely to lead well-functioning lives as adults. And, uh, you know, again, their, their well-being indicators are this, this family's in trouble. They really need help. And England's in the middle, California's pretty darn low, mostly because the social worker said, that's really not our concern. Risk and safety today, well-being in the long term, that's not really what our job's about. Um, OK, so as we summarize some of these, uh, there's a wide range of children's concerns that fall under this umbrella of child welfare. More kids are more likely to access services. There's a potential for intrusive government involvement and children's long-term interests may be just as relevant as short-term concerns. So as we think about tilting our service system to look more like a Nordic country, we just want to be cautious that in doing that, we don't open our doors so wide that we end up providing more intrusive services to families, to many, many more families than we otherwise would. Okay? So shifting for just a minute to continue to think about kids and the kids' framework, well, where where do we come up with our risk and safety framework? We come up with it because government, meaning legislators, wrote laws that told us that that's the way it's going to be, right? So let's look at the framework that's used in these other countries when it comes to kids, OK? The United Nations Conventions on the Right of the Child. You all are aware of it. You know that it is a UN document that, is, that enumerates fundamental human rights that children in all countries should have, okay? It is very clear about four fundamental rights in particular. The child's right not to be discriminated against. The child's best interest as a fundamental consideration in all decisions that concern him or her. The child's right to life and development. And the child's right to participate and express his or her views, especially vis-a-vis -vis administrative or judicial decisions, according to his age and maturity. That's the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Has the, UN, has the United States signed the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child? No. Has any other country? Somalia. Yeah, one other country. Somalia. Mm -hmm. We're keeping company with Somalia on this one, guys. Okay? So the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is the, 
is the law that the Norwegians and the Finns use to create their child welfare system. So you can see why it's a best interest framework, right? And then England sort of speaks to the UNCRC, and of course we have no UNCRC connection. So it makes sense why we would have this difference. Here's um, a little bit of uh, kind of too much detail, sorry. So briefly, what does it say? Because the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child says children need to have decision-making power in issues that affect their lives, they've written it into their law, okay? So regardless of a child's age, they should have their opinions heard. And in Finland, if you're a child age 12 or older, you can disagree with the removal decision. In Norway, if you're age seven or older, you're given the opportunity to have a voice and to show your opinion. Age 12, you're heard and opinion is given weight. And at age 15, you are a party to the case, meaning you, you, you're similar to this, you can agree or disagree with the decision, okay? In England, we give you a lawyer, and in the United States, we give you a lawyer, okay? So kids don't have voice themselves, but we give you a lawyer to voice your best interest concerns, okay? What do you think? What do you think about allowing 12-year-olds to direct the course of their case? Yeah. One of my first concerns is like parent coercion, like how how do parents talk to their kids about that? Uh -huh. Is it a family decision, like uh -huh. the social worker, or uh -huh. is it parents telling the kid you better make the right decision? Mm-hmm. 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 So you're concerned that kids are not independent actors; they're dependent upon their parents, and they might be swayed by coercion of some kind. Okay. And going off of that, even if they aren't forced, it's still a lot of pressure to put off. Especially a child who, like, I mean, we know in our system that that um, kids, even if after they're placed at home, even if they really enjoy being with their foster parents and are living really good lives, they still feel this connection to their bio mm -hmm. parents. So it kind of puts them in a different spot. So I hear you're feeling protective towards kids. You want to sort of protect them from the difficulty of this of this weight, this responsibility. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just think that there's such a variation in maturity levels. Yes. Today, because I, I know a family I work with where uh, one of the siblings was 12 and was extremely mature and had herself very well in court mm -hmm. um, and probably better than some 30 year olds. Mm -hmm. but, but there are also a lot of 12 year olds where that is way too overwhelming and they're very easily persuaded. So mm -hmm. it's just, it's so hard to tell because mm -hmm. it's such a case by case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm hearing that you're sensitive to the whole age and maturity rubric of, well, if they're old enough and they're mature enough, you wouldn't want to be held to an age standard necessarily. Okay. Yeah? I'm curious how this is actually operationalized, though, because I think it's, it's one thing to say that children have the right to talk in court, and it's another thing to actually let that statement direct the course of action that's mm -hmm. taken. We'll see in just a minute. You're my plant. <laughs> Other comments before we get to the data about whether you think that it's a good thing. Is legal representation enough in California? And w let's separate out. There's also two dimensions, right? There's your interaction with kids when you are trying to make this decision about, am I going to recommend to the court that removal is, is desired? And then there's going to court, OK? They're two different things. So, so maybe, so you were sort of saying, you know, court might be a kind of a scary place. Well, what about not the court part? What about you, your practice with families? Should you be engaging kids and asking them whether or not a removal is in their best interests? Yeah. I have some concerns about the just the cognitive ability of a 12-year-old to uh, weigh out the complexities of a situation that would mm -hmm. you know, potentially be, allow for them to stay or to be removed from the complexities mm -hmm. and the brain development of a 12-year-old. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Really good point. So again, sort of protective but also capacity, right? I think if you rest it solely with 
the child, you're essentially asking them to potentially go against their parents. And mm. how do you do that as a child? And we do focus on reunification. How do you reunify after that, after the child has said, I don't want to mm. be here? Mm. That's interesting, too. So it sort of sets the course in a way that's hard then for you to practice to reunify if they said this isn't working for me. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Going along the like protective lines, mm -hmm. the can too is if what they've been through has been normalized for them and mm -hmm. they think if that's okay, are they really gonna be able to make that judgment call if they mm -hmm. think, well this is okay because we do this and my siblings do this too, even though that's not what is healthy mm -hmm. or normal for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They don't have the same perspective. Mm -hmm. That, that you might, yeah. Kind of speaking of siblings, like what happens when a sibling moves in these situations? Does an older sibling get to decide I'm staying home, but the younger ones have to be mm, separated mm. off because of that? Oh, that'd be interesting to see what happens to sibling groups and whether or not we then make different decisions for siblings. Oh, yeah. that's interesting, yeah. I might be a lone voice here, but I want to say that I really like the idea of engaging children and making decisions about um, their futures, and I think all of these are valid concerns, but uh -huh. I also, I am interested in that idea of what voice kids have about their lives and their futures. Uh -huh. Such a Berkeley disruptive disruption. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Be brave about those lone voices. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. in order to actually engage a child, you should want to build that relationship and you should want to value them as a person and whether or not you go off of what they say, because that's what the purpose of being a professional mm -hmm. is, and having conversations with other professionals is you can really like weigh their opinions with like safety mm -hmm. standards and mm -hmm. other things, but just valuing their word and saying like, I see where you're coming from, mm -hmm. or I see how you could feel that way. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're a client too, so really honoring them that way. Nice, so, yes. nice. So you n might not necessarily honor their opinion, but you've heard their opinion and you respect it and you sort of verify it and then you figure out there are ways in which maybe on the margins you can attend to what they're concerned about. Yeah. So I would say the difference for me is a difference between participation and determination. Aha. Uh -huh. You know, Good. participation, I think we could get a lot of people on board about having them have a voice and engaging them yeah. in the process of of finding out some more, right. which can help lead the adults to, you know, better solutions and, and possibilities versus a lot of weight being put on a 12-year-old mm -hmm. to make a decision that mm -hmm. they're not fully capable mm -hmm. of. Really nice distinction. Participation versus determination. Absolutely. Do you include youth in your family team decision making? You do family team decision making in Wisconsin? You do family team decision making in Wisconsin? Kind of, some, maybe not. Yeah. So, <laughs> location, 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 yeah. right? In some places it sounds like you're doing it, in some places you're not doing it. I encourage you to do it. Um, uh, I encourage your agencies to do it if you're not doing it, because uh, it's just good social work practice. And one of the interesting things we see as we look at family team decision making sort of emerging across the United States of America is that family team decision making usually means the family, meaning the mom, and the family, maybe the grandma, and the youth isn't usually included. But they're part of the family too. Right? And again, there are all sorts of reasons and nuanced reasons why we want to be cautious about those environments and protect kids, especially in the group where they would be, it would be hard for them to participate, right? But it's interesting that 
the youth usually don't show up, okay? So these are complicated questions. I get it, they're complicated. And of course we want to be protective, but it is really interesting to think about ways in which kids and youth can be engaged in our practice to be deter, maybe not determinants, but participants in the process. I have a photo here, just before I go on, of the children's court in Los Angeles County. And um, the children's court is known in many places in juvenile, in the juvenile de de dependency field um, in LA as being the model. It is the model for being so child-centric. And so I was like, oh, okay, I gotta go see this really neat child-centric place, right? And so, does, first of all, that, if I'm five or seven or nine years old, that does not look like a child-centric place. <laughs> I could be wrong, okay, I could be wrong. So you go, so it's, it's big and scary, okay. You go in and, and there's this parking lot over here, right? You go in this parking lot and it's this massive parking lot and then you park and then it looks like a parking lot and then you go to the elevator and there's a giraffe painted on the elevator and you're like, oh, that's so cute. And then that's the end of the child-centric everything. <laughs> That's it, right? And it is a huge, and you've got the security guards, and you've got your, you know, the metal detectors, and you've got these halls and halls and halls, and you've got these waiting rooms crowded with adults and more adults and lawyers who are shouting. And it just depends on your perspective, right? And so, should a 12-year-old be given voice? Should a 15-year-old be given voice? in the decision making? Well, in some ways from one perspective we might want to be protective. <coughs> from their perspective, they want to be heard. So, it all depends on your perspective. So let's consider this case. You're working with a boy named Alex who is five years old, kind of a tiny one, whose family has received in-home services over a period of time. The case includes parental substance abuse, previous domestic violence, and general neglect. The circumstances of the case have deteriorated recently to such an extent that you're concerned that the boy's risk of harm is high. You're considering removing the child from his home and have informed the parents. The parents are opposing Alex's removal. Okay. So, again, we want to get a sense of these different countries. In your country, would you, in talking with the child, solicit the child's feelings, just his feelings, about what's going on? And in Finland and Norway, yeah, they solicit the child's feelings. They're not talking about a de determination about what's going to happen, but at least they solicit the child's feelings. And that really didn't show up in California or in England. And I didn't like that finding. I didn't like that finding. Now, it makes sense to me, because our law doesn't tell us that we really need to. But if we're going to be good social workers, it makes you wonder if whether we should, right? Is that an important thing? It probably is an important thing. Would you give information to the child and in Finland, of course, they would give information to the child. They would make a child fully informed about the whole process, okay? You didn't see it anywhere else. Even in Norway, where it's in the law, you have to. But it didn't really come up in California either. And part of that was because, well, I'll tell you why in a minute, part of the why. Would you gather information from the child? This is what we are good at. Because we had to find out if the allegation was true. Did it happen? Were you abused? Were you neglected? Did it happen? And would you include the child as a participant in decision making? Not a determinant, but a participant. And only the English said that they would do that. So even in Finland and Norway, where the law says they must, they didn't, right? And, and why? Uh, per what explains the difference? We think there are three reasons why, besides the law, right? The first is how much time they had to engage with kids, okay? So these are, in California, our front-end workers who are making a decision and have to get to court in 48 hours, right? So their response was, even if I wanted to, I don't, I don't have time to talk to kids. There's no time. I got 48 hours to get my paperwork filed in court, 
right? Um, you get three months to write a report in Finland. You get three months to sort of deliberate and determine and decide and discuss before you have to go to court in Finland, right? So there's probably more time to engage with kids in Finland than there is in California. England's a lot like California. Norway's more like Finland. You've got at least a month and a half to sort of do this deliberative process. Wow, could you imagine having weeks to figure this stuff out instead of potentially hours? It's an interesting idea, right? But again, we're only interested in risk and safety, so it kind of doesn't take that long to figure out risk and safety. But if you're trying to figure out if a kid's well-being is compromised, that takes a long time. It's a long time, okay? Also refers to the silos of practice. So in our comments from California, the workers routinely said, well, those are important things. It's just that I wouldn't do it. Lawyers do that. Lawyers talk to kids. I don't talk to kids. I talk to parents. Lawyers talk to kids. Now, whether you agree with that or not, I don't. That's what explains, theoretically, these differences. And then also it has to do with what the purpose of your engagement is. We talk to kids to get information from them because we're trying to ascribe blame for what happened, right? So that's why we talk to kids. Whereas if your well-being is what you're after, then to try to determine well-being, you engage kids in a different way, right? So it depends on your purpose of engagement. There's also, again, I should just say, this, the protective comments that many of you made at first came out very clearly in these surveys. Everybody's concerned about protecting kids' psychological well-being for really good reason in these really high-intensity situations. So, is the grass always greener? Did I hear somebody say yes? <laughs> I thought it was going to be you too, Rosemary. Yeah, Jill, it's a lot greener over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, just a comment. The Please. Reason they can take a longer time in deciding also is because they have all those wraparound services. Yes. Happening. So they have a yes. monitoring occurring with yes. the families where in many situations we don't. I really appreciate you saying that, absolutely. Part of the reason we have these, these tight time frames is because you know we're there in the moment, and then we're going to walk away. right? If we don't remove right now or call the police to help us make a removal right now, in many cases, then when we close the door, nobody is there to watch that child. Nobody's there to protect that child. You don't know whether the child will be dead by the morning. You don't know. And exactly in contrast, if when you close the door in Norway, there's three social workers who have different jobs who get to walk in and say, okay, let's make dinner. Okay, let's stop fighting. Okay, I'm gonna take the baby out for a while to go for a walk while you two work this out. You just don't worry about risk and safety because you are their, you are their, you're their platform to stand on, right? So really good comment. It, it really highlights to me this very fragile safety net that we have in the United States. When, when we think about what does it mean when we close the door to our families, it really does mean that they're on their own, right? I mean, you can get a referral, you can get some services maybe started in a week, but nobody's going to come to their home and be that sort of almost live-in person for them. So our risk, our risk as social workers, is much higher, right? What we are bearing, yeah. I just have a quick question about the, the social workers entering the homes. Yeah. So are those social workers that typically that's their sole role, mm -hmm. is doing that for families? Mm -hmm. Or are they more like I don't know, are ongoing workers where they're doing? They call them homemakers. Yeah. Homemakers. So it's like their sole role is doing that for families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Homemaker services, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So with all of these preventative measures in place, do they have fewer instances of these like really egregious abuse and neglect situations that we see here because they're in the home more? I, I guess, I mean, it's hard to tell because right. they're at a different threshold, but do they actually see less of that? Do they see less abuse in foster homes? You are asking the golden question. 
about, well, uh, abuse in foster homes, I'll come back to that in a minute. But part of, I've been doing this project with my colleagues, there's a couple of other permutations to it, for three years. So I talked to them a lot about, well, but what's, what's the case like? What's it like in Norway? Like, give me a case. And so they have now been bringing me some cases for me to look at, because I'm trying to figure out, you know, do we just have much more severe circumstances? Um, is, our, is our constellation of drug involvement, domestic violence, serious mental health, homelessness combined in these single families? I mean, is, is that what they're dealing with, or is it an entirely different phenomenon? And I can't get my finger on that, right? Because they don't really have studies where they took a whole random sample of a bunch of cases and then categorized them for me. That's what I'd like them to do. Um, <laughs> So instead, they bring cases to me, and they say, well, here's a case, and there'll be a case, and it looks like drug involvement and, you know, mental health issues and, and not homelessness um, and domestic violence. And like, okay, well, that looks like a case I know. I've seen those cases. But then they'll bring me a case <laughs> in our last meeting. Then they'll bring me a case of um, a mom who had a two-year-old, and the two-year-old kept coming to daycare with a soggy diaper. and they and who cares? I was like, what? <laughs> what? And it was a case in a child welfare agency. So is that 90% of the cases, or is that 1% of the cases? And are these 90% of the cases, or are they 1% of the cases? They don't know. They don't really have data tracking systems. And they certainly don't use risk assessment tools like we use in California that give us these sort of severity indi indices. So I don't know whether we're comparing apples and oranges or apples and apples. I just don't know. Have you actually been over, I don't know if you said that, but have you been yeah. over there and yeah. talked and like shadowed any of the language? They speak Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> and they speak Finnish. I mean, people who are in the universities all speak English. I mean, we are ridiculous. I don't speak, I don't speak Norwegian, right? They all speak English. But the families and the workers who work in the homes speak Norwegian. So, yeah, I've sat in a, I've sat in a child welfare office. Yeah, they're really nice places, right? They don't have, I don't know if you have them in Wisconsin, they don't have um, 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 security guards and bulletproof windows like ours do. <sighs> but, um, and they're nice places. But I don't know what the heck they were, anybody was saying. <laughs> I don't know. So these families have needs, and the social worker's coming in there because of the need, yeah. and so forth. How can they ever figure out then, because it sometimes takes five, seven years before a child's even removed, that right. they're providing all these services for the family, the parents can actually meet the needs without giving them that opportunity? Oh, oh, that's a good question. So they'll try to titrate, titrate it, right? So they'll bring a, a rich array of services, and then see if they can pull back on the, the saturation point to see if the family then can pick up, pick up the remainder. And then if they can't, then they just put it back back again again. Yeah. So they're very, you know, it's not like they're, um, they do talk to me a lot about resource constraints. I like, yeah, okay. <laughs> they do talk a lot about resource constraints. So they have managers, just like you have managers, who are saying, really, can we be done now? Or really, do we have to do all that? all that much. So they get a lot of pressure to try to reduce services. There's no question about it. But their baseline is really, really different from ours. And so they have their, their reasons for withdrawing services, even partially, are partly therapeutic and partly economic, just like ours are. That's a great question. So yes, they do. They have because our funnel, if you think of it as a funnel, right? We have all these kids in America and then mandated reporters send us the names of some people who are of concern and then we do a screen and we narrow that some more 
and then we do an investigation or an assessment and we narrow that more and we serve here, right? And so they have not, their funnel is a different funnel because you can self-refer, which a lot of families do. A lot of families self-refer. Excuse me, I need help, right? A lot of self-referral. They have referrals from teachers. They have t referrals from medical professionals, just like we do, for compromised well-being. And then they assess almost all of them. And they serve a very large proportion of them. Now, all of them don't get this deep end service that I was describing of, you know, the family visitor and all the rest of it. Many of them just need a little tiny service. So it's sort of a graduated service array, depending upon your need. But almost all of them get, get some sort of an assessment for their need and then a connection to a service of some kind. So it is a much richer, much broader touch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we kind of touched on it a little bit, but what what would they do if they got a report of stepdad is sexually abusing the kid? Like being in their home wouldn't necessarily like what sort of services would they provide when there is an immediate safety issue? That's true. They do. It does happen. It does happen. They'll make a removal decision. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Would but it still be that same sort of thing where. I don't know the answer to that. That hasn't come up in our conversations. I don't know the answer to that. So that'll be a good thing for me to find out when I go back in April. Um, but yeah, so that has so you no, know, it has come up. The what they call emergency ref emergency removals definitely come up. They say it's a very very small proportion. I've seen numbers. I can't remember. I can't tell you what they are right now. So they, it does happen. Doesn't happen very often, and I don't know what they do about reunification in those cases. So that's a really good question. Yeah. What do their caseloads look like? Like, how many people would they serve? And like, also with the paperwork, I would imagine it would be less because they don't have to do the permanency plans and things like that. Mm -hmm. So they have more time to spend with mm -hmm, families. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That their their caseload might be a little bit smaller because they're spending so much time. Mm -hmm. Mm, I don't know their caseload is smaller, but their workload is smaller. <laughs> their, uh, their paperwork workload is smaller. Um, part of the reason that this enterprise began, again, so we've been talking a lot about, well, what could we learn from them? Boy, have they been learning from us, right? They don't collect much data. They don't document very much um, in terms of their case case activity. Now, if you get to a removal, actually, we haven't talked about this. This is so interesting, so interesting. So that report, I showed you the, the time dimensions of writing the report. So the report that the Finns and the Norwegians need to present to court is a really big behemoth of a report. Many, 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 many dozens of pages long that gives all sorts of information about the kids and the, and the family. The court in Norway is composed of a judge, a community member, and a specialist, usually a child psychologist. So it's a three-person deliberative body. And in Finland, it's a judge and a magistrate, a local official of some kind. Okay. In Norway, the hearings last from two to three days. And in Finland, they last approximately two weeks. California, they last seven minutes. We did a, stu we did a study. We did a study in California so we could just like quantify it. We get seven minutes of justice in California. How much do you get in Wisconsin? Is it better than that, I hope? Uh, and, uh, well, so these are uncontested hearings, right? Uncontested. A contested hearing, obviously, in California would be longer. You would actually have a hearing that would involve m more deliberation. But they're typically uncontested, which is also a big question mark in my mind, right? Um, and in Finland, they are, they are they're deliberative. They're just deliberative, right? So you take, take a long time to figure it out. Wow, things could be different. Just think what that would do to our court system. Oh my god. <laughs>
<laughs> Think of LA County. Oh my goodness, just terrifying. Yeah. In these systems, though, you said their outcomes are no better than ours. No. What is what is what, you, what is being measured as far as the outcome? So they've looked at some of the same things that Mark Courtney has looked at. They've looked at um, rates of, uh, of high school completion and college graduation, unemployment. Um, uh, they don't look at mar marriage and marital stability because that's kind of really old fashioned in Europe. Um, they look at um, uh, early pregnancy and parenting, um, incarceration. And their rates are very, very high, right? Now, again, for those of you familiar with Mark Courtney's work, also a great Berkeley alum, got to love that. Just have to put me a plug in when I can. Um, Mark's study really has more recently uh, sort of shown the array of outcomes for youth who leave our foster care system. And rather than assuming that it's all gloom and doom, it is certainly not. So his data has definitely shown there are sort of four groups of young adults, ages 16 to 24 who leave our system and between 25 to 30 percent of them are kind of doing okay and another 25 to 30 percent of them somewhere in those numbers are struggling around early parenting and economic woes but are doing okay it's really that 18 percent who are troubled he calls troubled and troubling so really 18 percent are truly struggling 35%, 30 to 35% are doing okay, and then there's a distribution in the middle. So we have to remember that there's a distribution among our youth, and some do okay, some go to college, University of Wisconsin, some go to graduate school and social work, which I love, and some don't. So similarly, for them, they have these difficult outcomes like we do in the sense that when you turn it upside down and you look at things like the prison system, you do see that it is overpopulated by kids who've come from foster care because it just depends on which perspective you're looking at. Right? Any other questions? Is there anything from our conversation today that makes you think, I might do something a little bit differently in my agency tomorrow? And if so, what would that be? or long term, maybe not tomorrow, but when you're a supervisor at your agency, which you will be in a heartbeat. Yeah. I think um, I'm in ongoing now and I'm moving to IA in the next couple of weeks. IA means? Initial assessment, so okay. the investigating yep. portion. Um, but I liked the part that you talked about where it said risk and safety, and I think that's where my department is kind of centered at right mm -hmm. now, but then on the other side, the best interest, and so I was thinking when you were talking, I'm going to hang up like a big poster and have both of them so that I remember, because um, I think it's kind of important to balance yourself, and yes. I think we need to incorporate both, not just one or the other. So. It really, really is. Kids are so much more than just being little risk pools, right? They are so much more than that. And so to the extent that we can think about their well-being, we treat them as m more human, right, and more full. and we can even engage them as agents with us. Mm -hmm. So I love that you're going to do that. Yeah. Um, uh, most of us are students, so yes. we're not at agency like that. I thought you were in field placement, maybe. Some are. Some, some are. are. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I think that it's great pointers to take away mm -hmm. for when we are in field placement. I, mean, like mm -hmm. I currently, for work, actually work for Big Brothers Big Sisters. Oh. So it's different where I'm not a quote unquote social worker working in like CPS, but we provide social supports for sure. families. And sure. so it definitely makes me think about when I'm talking to parents about difficulties in school or mm -hmm. different aspects like that mm -hmm. of how to really put the best interests of the child first mm -hmm. when thinking about that. Mm -hmm. You know, and not placing blame on the parent for not helping Johnny with his homework, but what right. can we do to help him find other resources for homework help? Oh, I love it. Oh, I love that. That's wonderful. Good. Um, I, I think that I'm going to take more initiative to have those conversations with the kids and have those conversations with the parents that you just assume other people are talking to them about. Mm. Um, and, you know, if I assume that the lawyer is having that conversation, mm -hmm. I assume that, you know, their, their therapist is having that conversation. But to, you know, 
can't hurt to have that conversation more than once. So. It cannot hurt. Oh yeah. my goodness, absolutely. We have to be reminded that these are incredibly complicated systems that these families are walking into. They know almost nothing about these systems that we're living. And we went to school and we learned all the procedures and the, you know, the documents and the policies and they don't know much of it at all. And they're caught. They are caught. And they don't know how to get out. They don't know where the back door is. They don't have any sense of how to navigate these systems. And so you can be a navigator for them. Parent partners can be navigators for them. Peers can be a navigator, but they need navigators, right? And they need agency. They are going to do a better job being there, a parent for their kids when they feel like they're empowered. Oh, I know what I have to do to get there. Well, I know where the exit is. So absolutely, yeah. You had made a statement earlier that I felt was really impactful, is that you said what we name what we do drives what we do. Mm -hmm. And so I think just the language and what we use, I know there's terminology that we're used to using, mm -hmm. but maybe trying to change that when we are meeting with families and being mm -hmm. more positive mm -hmm. as, as much as we can be. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Just trying. Absolutely. I, I worry a little bit that our orientation towards risk and safety, as, as helpful as it is, and again, I'm not criticizing the, the, the concept, because I think it is helpful, it's measurable. I like that it's measurable. Um, I think, in fact, it's probably the single most important thing we can do to deal with racial disparities in the United States is by having a measurable way to say, you get in and you don't get in, because it has nothing to do with your race, it has to do with your safety. So I like risk and safety because of that reason especially. But when we only narrow our conversation to risk and safety, we forget kids, and we forget kids' well-being, and we forget development, and we forget all of the other pieces that are part of a life, right? So I would like to find a way to expand, to hold on to that importance, but then expand what we do and what we're about. And that language would be helpful. Yep. Anything else? Then I think... Oh, yeah, just this neat little quote. The whole object of travel is not to set foot on foreign land. It is at last to set foot on one's own country as a foreign land. So hopefully, as you've looked at those other countries today, that has helped you to think a little bit more about what you're doing here and to figure out, like, oh, OK, what is this place that I'm living in? And how do I want to sip my coffee in the morning, OK? All right, so thank you so much. A pleasure meeting all of you.